I mean, we've had quite a few notable successes over the years. Um, one that really stands out um, is with a, a therapist here in Vancouver. Um, and when we started working together, it was just her um, in a small office. Um, and she would get maybe like a mm, hundred visits a month on her website. And mm -hmm. so we started working together, um, optimizing her service pages and homepage content, and then building out a blog content strategy where we were uh, publishing a new piece uh, every week, so four per month. Um, and, and our one of the bigger uh, counseling businesses here in Vancouver. Uh, and really like the traffic has been a huge part of that. And Google search is far and away the biggest channel in terms of growth uh, and marketing efforts for uh, her practice. Because search intent is the most underappreciated component of, of keywords in that when somebody does a search for a phrase, they have an, an intention or an expectation of what they're looking to find. I would say the first thing that people need to think about when starting into an SEO strategy is thinking three and six months down the road. Does AI generated content work? Or what's your, even your view on it, really? This, oh man. <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, you own your web property. You don't own your Facebook audience. You don't own your TikTok. You don't own your LinkedIn Thank fan. You. And the whole point of those is to get people to your website. Hey guys. Welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. Today we have a wonderful guest. Today we have Jesse Ringer. Jesse, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm happy to be here. You are a guest that I've wanted to talk to for quite some time. I'm going to tell you why. I work in digital marketing. Not much of a fan of SEO, mind you. I, <laughs> I've avoided SEO like the plague, and um, I mm -hmm. can't avoid it anymore. I'm happy to have you on happy to learn from you i would love for you to share a bit more with us about your seo agency a little bit more about your strategies and just your story to date sounds good sure so uh yeah i'm the founder of method metric uh, a digital agency based in vancouver bc um you know and we specialize in seo analytics and conversion rate optimization um I've been doing SEO now for 12 years and I've been running my own agency for, for six of those. Um, we work with a lot of different brands across the e-commerce space and software space, as well as working mm -hmm. with uh, other kind of service-based businesses as well. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of questions and um, I'm going to slowly ease into them. First one, most importantly, why SEO? No, why have why did you choose SEO, or was it a situation that you did not choose SEO and SEO chose you? <laughs> uh, man, so uh, when I was starting out in my career, um, I really wanted to be in advertising, doing copywriting and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, getting into that space was quite challenging. Uh, and when I would be writing content for my bosses or clients, uh, you know, whenever they had negative feedback, they'd be like, I don't like this. I didn't really have a good response. I didn't know how to articulate my, my thoughts and opinions in a productive way uh, until I found SEO where, you know, when someone said they didn't like my writing, I could point them to the analytics and show them that their page was ranking for uh, a bunch of keywords and generating a lot of traffic. And ultimately it was generating them revenue. And so it SEO kind of gave me the confidence to, you know, start doing my own thing, but it also uh, gave me kind of a, a voice to advocate for myself and show people what I was capable of. So I like your story. I like your story because it shows um, genuine progression. And I think it's also a good fit for you. 
and I work in marketing, right? And one of the things that you find happen a lot when we speak with prospects, so we do website software marketing. You're going to get a website that's not going to be very good for generating leads and revenues. It looks good. And you'll say that to the prospect and the prospect will say, no, no, I love my website. Website is fine. I don't need a website redesign. And you're going to say to them, and this is where the statistics come in and the analytics. You're going to say, well, how much money did you make from your website last month? And they can't give you an answer because they didn't make any money. SEO is very similar. You got into SEO because you wanted to prove that what you're doing is effective and you have the analytics to back it up. Here's my problem though. White at SEO, black at SEO, and you're trying to hire the right guy. How do you know that the person is even good at SEO? It takes a while to get results. So it's not like you can bring them in and say, all right, so after two days, nothing's happened. You're out. So how do you know when someone actually knows what they're doing in SEO? Yeah, uh, you're right. SEO does take a lot of trust. Uh, it's not like, mm-hmm. you know, building a new website or, you know, designing, I don't know, a new poster where you can see the finished product at the end of the day, right? It, it's mm-hmm. you as a client won't necessarily see the finished product until the revenue starts coming in and the traffic starts showing up. So with SEO, you know, to be able to distinguish between a good SEO, a great SEO and a crappy one is um, communication first and foremost, you know, um, asking them important questions right off the bat. Like what is their process for, you know, getting rankings? How do they research and strategize? Um, But also like, do they make any guarantees? And if they're making guarantees about the traffic or the progress or the revenue that they're going to generate for you, they're probably not doing anything that is necessarily above board. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think one thing too to, to point out is that when it comes to SEO, the shady tactics, they will work really well at the early going. Um, but as soon as Google catches on, you know, you're going to see a huge mm-hmm. hit. And, you yeah. do run the risk of being removed from Google search results entirely, which mm-hmm. would probably kill most businesses. So um, when it comes to finding a good and vetting a good agency or a contractor in the SEO space, you know, ask them to point to previous projects, um, mm-hmm. ask them, you know, a lot of questions it's about this. their process, you know, how, you know, kind of go about how do you figure out how you trust someone? You know, like get to know them, get to know their work, um, you know, and take your time, be really diligent, have lots of conversations with different agency owners, different contractors, because that way you'll start to hear what the kind of different responses are. And there's so many ways to do SEO effectively that it's really going to come down to the, you know, to the style or the, the process that they have that will help them get results. Mm-hmm. That sounds good. By aggregating responses, so you get responses from different people mm-hmm. within the niche, within the space, the industry, you're going to have an idea of what's good and what's not good and who knows what they're talking about and what's to be expected. You know, the thing that I want you to just expound on a bit, you know, whenever you find this cool new hack, for example, at one point, it was just creating a web page and posting the same word and linking it back to your website for the backlinks. And then Google is like, no, 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 the authority of the website matters. Can you just talk to us about some of the biggest mistakes, the biggest errors? You can call them sins, grievances, felonies, mind you, that you see people make when they're doing SEO. And some of them willingly, some of them unknowingly as well. Yeah. Um I would say the most common, there's two pieces. Uh, the first one that most like business owners and entrepreneurs and people managing websites um, that do most often is over-optimizing uh, for a certain keyword. And what that means is like inserting that phrase like everywhere throughout the content rather than writing more organically and naturally. Um, people are trying to shoehorn their, their target keywords into, into the entire content. The other piece to that as well is using the same keyword across multiple pages. And so with a good strategy, it's important to target a variety of keywords, um, each on its own 
landing page. Um, and so making sure that there's a diversity of target terms that you're trying to rank for. The other side of it, and this comes down to web developers more so, but also people like working in building their own businesses and such, um, is the technical components, like making sure that their website is communicating properly with the search engines, making sure that you have kind of like the basic robots.txt XML sitemap um, and kind of those technical rules in place. Um, that's one area that we see like quite often people overlook. That's true. And um, you're familiar. Well, of course you are. Do you think an SSL certificate is right up there as one of those things or are they becoming more common these days that people actually have them? Yeah, an SSL certificate uh, is not a ranking factor, but for any business that is trying to build trust um, with their with their clients, mm -hmm. need to have one because it ensures that anyone visiting their website, their personal data isn't going to be stolen. Whether they're clicking on links, filling out forms, uh, you know, even and right down to making e-commerce purchases. Um, if your website does not have an SSL certificate, you're putting all of your visitors and customers at risk. The other side of that too, is that with like Chrome and Firefox, if they mm -hmm. detect that your website doesn't have an SSL certificate, they're going to prompt every visitor with a warning that this web page is unsafe and should not be visited. So although it's not a direct ranking factor, it's going to have huge implications on your business and on your traffic and ultimately on your revenue. Yeah, and most people aren't going to be the brave man. or probably the reckless one that I am. I'm like, ah, oh, no, it's fine. I'm still going. <laughs> because this big red screen pops up. This website is not safe. Nope, turn back. You know, the thing yeah. that always blows my mind when it comes down to SEO, and I'm just going to put it right out there. <laughs> on the surface, it seems boring. It seems like there isn't much art to it. But you see, the more you dig into what is actually being done, like you learn the strategies, you learn, all right, it's not just putting words on a page. You have to craft the right words. You have to make the page attractive. You have to ensure that the page keeps users on. You have to make the page found, um, being able to be found for this and this search term and then connect it to this page so that it leads people or visitors, actually, through a journey. When it comes down to SEO, it's more art than science. But... I don't think that gets expounded on much enough. I don't think we talk about that enough. So in terms of SEO strategies, let's say for an e-commerce concern, because we are right around Black Friday, Cyber Monday, as we're filming this episode. It's going to be out mm -hmm. around Christmas or thereabout, because we have a lot of episodes. When it comes down to SEO strategies, is there one that you could share with us that could help the novice get a winner or two? Like, even if it's not a full strategy, it's just some do's and don'ts. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I would say the first thing that people need to think about when starting into an SEO strategy is thinking three and six months down the road. Okay. What is your website going to look like? Um, what are you going to be mm, sharing? What, what is it gonna, the brand going to feel like in that time? Because what you do today is likely not going to see an impact for, you know, three to six months within the search results. Mm -hmm. The other part of that, you know, the choosing your keywords, like that is arguably the hardest part of any of all of the SEO fundamentals. Like how do you choose the right keywords? And, and that is, straight up just spending a lot of time in the search results, like going in, searching the key phrases that you want to rank for and looking to see who else is ranking there, what kind of content is ranking in those search results. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Google has a ton of built in uh, like snippets and features within their search results. Like, are there maps there? Are there shopping ads? Are there carousels? Is a YouTube video at the top? Having a good in piece of research around like what those search results looks like will help you figure out what keywords you should be targeting um, and how you should be writing your content and styling your content um, for those searches because search intent is the most 
underappreciated component of of keywords in that when somebody does a search for a phrase, they have an an intention or an expectation of what they're looking to find. You know, if I was searching for, I don't know, the latest Nike shoes, I would hope to see shopping ads at or near the top. Um, and if I was looking for how to water my plants properly, I would expect to see a tutorial on how to water my plants and not like where to buy plants. And so trying to match that search intent with your content is the best way for you to rank well, but also to engage with your audience so that they are confident and comfortable taking action with your business and on your website. I love that because then now you'll be making the right content for the right person. And we can also talk about the customer journey. You see, this is all art, right? This yeah. at this stage. Like if science. you and I were to start talking about how to water plants, like your audience is going to tune out, right? Like yeah. it matters. It matters the context in which people are engaging uh, and the way that you're presenting your information to That's true. your people. I want to double down on content as well. So chat GPT, Jarvis, Frizzly, Elementor has their own content writing application. Um, even a WordPress theme has it. I think you have copy AI. So many AI content generators out there. So many, you can't even count them on one hand. Does AI generated content work? Or what's your, even your view on it, really? There's, oh man, <laughs> okay, laughing. there's two questions there. The <laughs> first question, my view of AI content is that it can be used to support and help you with like a jumping off point for writing new content, but it shouldn't be left unchecked by a human being. Yeah. Um, because AI content is an aggregation of all of the content on the internet. So it's just an average. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be average. Like, why yeah. would you create a piece of content that was just average? average. People, customers, we want to do business with brands that resonate with our worldview in a multitude of ways. But like, we want to be able to connect with a brand in some way, you know, it's, it's integral. Like, why would I spend my money with a brand that is, you know, average and it doesn't really take a stand in any direction, you know, it's, it's very much a space in which like, you won't lose any arguments because you're very neutral with your AI content, but you're not going to win any arguments either. Like if I'm trying to convince you that SEO is the best form of marketing ever, I wouldn't leave that to AI because AI would just be like, yeah, it helps you rank better and da, da, da. Meanwhile, in my view, I think SEO impacts every other digital marketing initiative because you need blog content to fill your social media calendars. You need, um, you know, pages that are effective for your ads. You mm -hmm. need, yeah, you need content on your website and you need a good effective website in order to get people to come to your brand. Mm -hmm. So anyway, with that point, like AI content, use it to get you started. If you're unsure of like the angle you should take with a, a, a content piece or what have you, but at the end of the day, you know, your content needs to align with your brand. And if it's not because you're using AI content, people are going to read through it. People are going to know that that content was not made by someone that understands their needs the way mm -hmm. that another brand will so the soul of the content the emotions that personal connection that um identity that thing that makes it personal between you and your reader that eventually leads to the sale that's missing from ai content and i believe here's the thing you know i don't believe that at times we use ai content for what it is the role of ai in my personal opinion is never to really replace the individual right? The role exactly. of the factory was never to replace the factory worker or the person that was working doing the duties of the equipment of the factory. The role of the car was never to replace, well, it replaced the horse carriage, but was never to replace 
what you do when you travel. It's mm. to make it more efficient, right? And I believe AI is along the lines. It's to make us think faster, have a better understanding, a lot faster about what we're trying to work on. It's to make us more efficient. If we think about it in that perspective, like you said, it's also a very good starting point because unbeknownst to most people, around three or four years when Jarvis started, Jarvis or... Um, I don't think they're still called Jarvis, but you know who, you know which company I'm talking, right? They're like the biggest copywriting company out there. They were mm-hmm. called Jarvis, but I don't remember the, the name right now. When they started, they said that they were built to be an assistant and their landing page said, never have writer's block again. Now, for those of us who are into content, writer's block is when you sit around the computer or you have pen in hand and you have no idea what to write. Funny story though, Writer's block also affects artists, and Eminem made a song about having writer's block. So, I don't know. Good for him. The reason I bring up all of this is because, like you said, context matters. And I think that we should keep in context, keep in mind the context of what AI really is supposed to be. It's supposed to be an assistant. It's supposed to make us better, but it's not supposed to replace us. And I think that that's also important. You are working with SEO for quite some time. Could you just tell us about some of your success stories, some of the wins that you've got your clients over the years? Sure. Um, Yeah, I mean, we've had quite a few notable successes over the years. Um, One that really stands out um, is with a a therapist here in Vancouver. Um, And when we started working together, it was just her um, in a small office. Um, and she would get maybe like a mm, hundred visits a month on her website. And mm-hmm. so we started working together, um, optimizing her service pages and homepage content, and then building out a blog content strategy where we were, uh, publishing a new piece, uh, every week. So four per month, um, and focused very much on her like core specialties. Um, and yeah, within about six months, uh, we had hit 500 monthly sessions. Um, Mm -hmm. and then it just continued to compound from there. And now we're sitting at about, uh, 6,000 monthly visits. Um, but from a business standpoint too, like traffic is great, right? Traffic, that's lovely. But, um, you know, her client base grew so much that she had to have four other, uh, associates. And Mm -hmm. so her team has grown quite a lot and has, uh, really, yeah, kind of changed her whole business trajectory just from, from search. It's still the biggest channel for her. And from a business perspective, she was able to add five other associates um, and are one of the bigger uh, counseling businesses here in Vancouver. Uh, And really like the traffic has been a huge part of that. And Google search is far and away the biggest channel in terms of growth uh, and marketing efforts for uh, her practice. I love that. I love that story because that's relatable to a lot of people, they are starting out. And the thing Mm -hmm. I want our audience members to also take consideration of is that when you do SEO, you're in it for the long term, right? So you're not going to do SEO today and hope to get it in three months. You're looking to a year. You you can get results before that, but ideally you want to do for a year. And the reason why I say this is important is because when you're doing a business, you're doing a business for the long haul, all right? So this is a very good fit if you have a very low marketing budget you don't know how to run ads and you want to work with something that is very good. 92.3% the last time I checked of search traffic goes through Google. If you make Google and your website very close friends, you have a chance. Let's say that there is an audience member listening, they're watching, and they would like to talk with you. They would like to get a consultation and perhaps even do business with you. How do they go about that? Where is the website? Yeah. Is there a contact number? What's your process? I mean, we'd be a terrible SEO agency if we didn't have a website. Yeah. Um, that was a bad question. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, our website is methodandmetric.com. Uh, uh, and yeah, you can find me personally on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, Jesse Ringer. Uh, and our Method and Metric channel on LinkedIn and Instagram um, are both quite active. Um, yeah, we have tons of free resources on our website for people that are looking to work on their own SEO. Um, but I'm always very happy to have a conversation, uh, to help any businesses kind of grow their web presence, but also just kind of figure out how SEO and digital marketing can really help their businesses. So you do a lot more than just SEO, also do digital marketing then, right? We help with the website strategy. So ensuring that, you know, at the end of the day, you own your web property. You don't own your Facebook audience. You don't own your TikTok. You don't own your LinkedIn fan. And the whole point of those is to get people to your website. And Mm -hmm. that is how we help. Yes, Google is a massive traffic generator. Um, but you also need to have a good website that people want to, you know, interact with. And so you need to have that in place if you're going to be engaging with newsletters, um, social media, paid ads, like all of those channels need to have a sound, robust and effective website in order for any of those marketing channels to be anywhere near effective. That's true. And the thing that I always tell prospects is that same thing you just said, you don't own your social media accounts. It's like a rental uh, at any point in time. And this tends to happen quite a lot, especially on Facebook. Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn can say, you know what? We don't particularly like what you've been doing here. Um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to close your account. But um, thanks for growing mm-hmm. with us for these past few years. Thanks for the money you invested, but it's over. Yeah. And you have to like, go with that. What if the, like TikTok gets banned from the U.S.? You know, like, what are you going to do with that audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Facebook, again, like they could be shut down. I mean, granted, anything can happen in the world. Like your servers can go down and all that kind of stuff. Google could be broken up and not allowed to do search anymore. I don't know. But the reality is that you own that domain name, right? And you own that content that you've created on that website and nobody can legally take that away from you. And so... Get traffic to your website, own that audience. Same with newsletters. Like I think newsletters are such an underutilized uh, marketing channel. And as again, like if someone gives you their email address, that's currency. That's something that you can hold on to and you don't have to worry about algorithms changing or corporations deciding that they're pivoting to another direction. Like Mm -hmm. those two, your website and your email list are probably the most important digital marketing assets that you can have. I second that because here's the thing. You see, this is a trivia question. I'm going to give you a bit of background on this trivia question. I've asked this question three times. So I've asked it to Thiago Farias. He is an ex-Google ad expert. He used to work at Google in the Google ads department. I've yeah. asked it to Yaron Bin. He spent over $10 million on Facebook ads. I've asked to Lisa Apolinsky. She's added over ten bi- she's had over a billion dollars in revenues to her clients since she started marketing. And I'm asking it to you. Here's the question. We are one on one. So one right, one incorrect. And Lisa somehow managed to not give an answer that was either right or wrong. I don't know how she did, but she's really creative like that. So I'm gonna ask you, among all the digital marketing media and assets, which one is the most profitable marketing media or asset? that you can use in 2023. And I can give you the ROI as a hint if you want as well. Sure. I'll the take ROI, the ROI. The ROI is one to 44, meaning that for every dollar you put in, you're expected to make on average $44 in return. Only one marketing media, the most profitable. Is that email? It is email. Oh, yes, you got it on the first try. That is email. Two to one now. And... Here's the thing that I want you to talk about a bit. And this is a trend that I'm noticing. So when I spoke to Tiago Farias, Tiago mm-hmm. worked at Google and he was also the leader of their marketing department in Eastern Europe. So a lot of the big brands that we know from Europe, he's worked with their executives directly. 
And he left and he started what's called the anti-marketing movement and mm-hmm. anti-marketing strategy. All it basically says is that don't do Google ads, don't do Facebook ads. This is how you're going to monetize your audience. And that's where you get the email marketing and your social media following and get clients from that. He's, he's pretty good at what he does. The reason why I bring this up is because he said that a lot of times we get caught up in the glitter and the glamour of the new and the popular. So, you know, TikTok shops are popular right now and they're printing a lot of money. So a lot of people are going to get on that. SEO, on the other hand, has been around since the dinosaurs have been with us. They're no longer here, but SEO remains. It's not the new and sexy. Email marketing birthed the dinosaurs. You know, email marketing has been here. It's not the new and sexy, but they are so effective at generating leads, increasing revenues, and so pivotal to your online success. Here's the question. SEO and email, not very new, not very sexy, but so effective. What are we doing wrong? Or what is a common misconception that makes us not focus on these tried and true proven methods, and we're going after what we think is a new shiny object. What is your opinion oh, on yeah. that? I got a lot of opinions about that. Yeah. The, the most direct one I would say is that mm-hmm. people see the new and shiny for sure, but they also see people that were like first past the gate, turning it into huge profits uh, and like are winning at those games. And we instantly see ourselves being able to replicate that. And because the media loves new and shiny, they tend to, you know, overestimate and over promote those new channels saying that they are the be all end all and they're going to revolutionize everything. Like look at how much coverage has come about about AI. We could talk about NFTs. Like Mm. those things were like super popular and everyone got in because they saw other people making tons of money and most people don't. And with SEO and email, they don't offer immediate return. You know, it takes time to build up a good list and it takes time to, you know, get that, that re- those revenues firing and stuff. Same with SEO, it takes time. And so the other side of my opinion about it is that the instant gratification of paid ads and from social media, um, that's way more satisfying for most people uh, mm-hmm. than waiting it out and, and seeing the, the long-term impact of doing email and doing SEO. That's, that's true. And also because it's like we see this new thing. And the thing about new things is that there's a little bit of competition when it just gets started. So I've heard, I've heard a lot of people say two things. So, you know, TikTok shops are the new thing. But I've actually heard people say that they spend $20 and they make X amount on TikTok shops. And they think, oh, well, this is working. So let me scale. Let me spend $50. And they don't make the... So they might think they're going to make two and a half X because they're spending two and a half times more. And that hasn't happened. And the other thing, because I'm just expounding on the new and shiny, you know, when TikTok just got popular, you could create an account, you post content, you get a lot of impressions, hundreds of thousands of impressions, and your account just droops and it balloons and it grows and it looks so nice to have a million followers. Everybody had a million followers back then. That's not happening anymore. And the reason why I bring these two points up is because when something is novel, it's new, there aren't a lot of people doing it, a lot of competition. So it's a lot easier to get success versus what's tried and true when someone is getting success. So you're here with us. You have had results with SEO. And like you said, within three months, five five times the amount of traffic. Now they have five more therapists in this company. Completely changed the outlook of that business. That's the story that we need to make the headlines because that's something that's tried and true. That's something that's proven. That's something that's been around. But when you look at TikTok, for example, and I'm just saying TikTok because it's what's new and novel at this time. Because there isn't a lot of competition, by the time this platform matures and all these little hacks and tweaks and things that are working, people get used to them so they don't connect with them as much anymore. That's when you're going to find the true heroes, the true people that have been um, building something that works. So I think that's also a small part of why things are the way they are. Now, given that you've been in this space for over 10 years and 
some quite interesting news came out over the weekend with OpenAI, Sam Altman, Microsoft, mm. mind you. I, want, I don't know if you care to comment, but I'm going to tell you what I think could be happening here. So Google has their own AI generator. So when you do a Google search, the top result is going to be, if you've opted in actually, from AI just summarizing the points. Like you said, it's a summarizer. It's not going to give you the best. It's going to give you an average. Um, we have Microsoft. There's OpenAI. I don't know if Mozilla is doing anything or Apple. But I believe that the future of search is going to be AI assisted, right? Now, OpenAI has been the leader in AI innovation, the way I see it. This is all opinionated, guys. This is not statistics. This is not fact. This is opinion, very subjective. I believe that if this continues as it is in terms of Sam Altman, and I believe Greg, I don't remember his last name, joining Microsoft for their new Advanced AI Research Institute, I believe that Microsoft potentially being, is going to see a surge in usage in search over the next few years. And the thing that's also most fascinating about this is that not only did Sam Altman and Greg, I don't remember Greg's last name, but they're the co-founders of OpenAI. Not only those two join, but seven over 700 of 750 or so employees of OpenAI threatened to quit if Sam Altman was not reinstated. So let's assume that he's not reinstated. And let's say that 700 actually go ahead and quit, or even 350. And they go and they work with Sam at Microsoft with that massive budget that Microsoft has. Is it time for us perhaps to start looking at Bing and say, you know what, maybe just maybe we should start optimizing content for Bing as well? I think you... Long shot. I got two thoughts on that. One... Mm. AI, yes, AI is going to be an integral part of search. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think ChatGPT and the partnership with Microsoft is going to be the piece that pushes Bing over the top because there's mm -hmm. too much brand involved with Bing that people just don't like. People just feel that oh. Bing is not a good experience. One thing that I do believe that could help bring Bing's numbers up and getting more people to use it is Google's antitrust lawsuit. Granted, I have very little faith that anything of like real significance is going to happen with this case, but I do think that um, the fact that people are actively and openly talking about how Google is a monopoly and they rightfully are in a lot of parts of the world, um, that it will hopefully compel people to, to look at Bing as an option. And if AI does get rolled out, I think, you know, they can, they being Microsoft can overcome, you know, the barriers of a crappy search experience that they are known <laughs> for um, mm -hmm. and getting more people on board with it. You know, the thing with Google is that you can really see how much traffic comes from it and they offer a lot of built-in opportunities to generate revenue and make money. And yes, like ads is a big part of that. And that monopoly is its own thing. And, you know, shopping ads within Google are getting better. Once Google, I don't know, once Bing actually really catches up on that side of things, like the, the commerce side of things, then I think that there's a better opportunity for Bing to really excel. But mm -hmm. I think they got to really fight the, the stigma that people have. And it'd be pretty nice if Apple like didn't have Google as a default uh, uh, search uh, bar, but yeah. yeah, those are all things that are beyond my, my experience and beyond my knowledge, like how that's all going to play out is completely unknown to me. And it's early days as well. So it's very hard to yeah. Um, yeah. say exactly. But I don't know are. if AI will be the savior that Microsoft is hoping it's going to be. Cause again, we mm -hmm. still have to compete with the fact that, like TikTok is the largest search engine amongst people under the age of like 25, I think it was. And so, really, yeah, people are going there for restaurant reviews and like shopping ideas and stuff like that. People like that age group is not going to Google as a default. And granted, they're spending so much time on TikTok anyway, like it just becomes a search engine, a discovery engine. And so I think mm -hmm. Google and Bing are both kind of thinking about that about how to become a discovery engine again. That's, that's fascinating. I'm going to tell you why I think it's fascinating. And I'm just, 
putting my thoughts out there. Before, all right, so when TikTok started, right, when TikTok actually started, I looked at it as a missed opportunity for me. A lot of people don't know this. For myself, I looked at it as a missed opportunity. And why did I look at it as a missed opportunity? You see, at the time when TikTok started, Instagram was the in thing. And just as Instagram is maturing now and it's not so glitz and glam, it's not the buzzword anymore. That's what was happening to Facebook. And I knew, so I didn't know at first, but I've done enough study and learning up until that point to have learned at that point when TikTok started to take off that the next thing was going to be short videos. Here's why. There is always a natural progression from words to images to video. That's how it always has been. Work with the newspaper, work with the television, newspaper, radio, television, until they started to have ads. Social media. So we had Facebook, which was really the first really big thing that integrated everyone. And then we started mm -hmm. using images with Instagram. Now you can find old people on Instagram. It wasn't like that in the past. I knew that short videos was going to be the next thing. Snapchat was there, but it was never really that impactful. The reason why I bring all of this up is because you're the expert on SEO. You're the one that knows most about search and how it works. A lot of times when we search, and I know that videos on a page aren't a ranking factor directly, but indirectly they influence customer ex um, website visitor experience and time on website, which eventually becomes a ranking factor. Mm -hmm. I am wondering... If what we're seeing happening with TikTok that you've mentioned, that it's now, a, it's now being used for search, so video rev um, restaurant reviews, for example, recommendations and the like, coupled with influencer power. So brands and athletes and celebrities, they don't have the power they once had to sway the market. Smaller influencers like yourself, hopefully me at some point, with a following, with brand authority, with voice, are the ones that sway customers more than even PPC ads, for example. Could mm -hmm. we then see, and this is, a, this is where I was leading with the old question, could we then see an opportunity for TikTok to be a lot more than just a social media? Because, I don't know, whenever you hear about a business and you want to do business with them, you always look for reviews, you always look for their website, and you always look them up on Google. But if TikTok is now adding a new dimension to all you experience this business, video reviews, influencer reviews, perhaps um, video testimonials from people who have been at this restaurant and so on. Could this be a new direction in how not only TikTok operates, but in all, also in how we search and experience new information online? What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Uh, you know, for the time being, TikTok's plan is to stay on mobile. They intentionally make a bad desktop experience. Uh, My two cents of that is that if they want to mature as a social media platform, one that caters to a larger set of people and audience members, and also, um, you know, want to be a mechanism for marketers and business owners to generate revenue, because that's how they're going to have to start making their money is by selling ads. Um, they're going to need to evolve beyond this something that facebook does really well is like their community pages and you know their their marketplace right like yes that stuff still does really well mm -hmm. but to your point about videos on pages being a ranking factor on your website indirect i would say there's two parts of that you know one google still is not great at dissecting and understanding what the content of a video is they're working mm -hmm. on it and they're trying to get better at it, but tagging um, and descriptions and file names are still a big part of that. But on the flip side, Google does use page experience and how people are interacting on web pages as a way of ranking them. If, if Google sees that people are spending a good amount of time on a page, scrolling through, visiting other pages, those kinds of things, um, Google is much more likely to rank that page higher. So if you do have video mm -hmm. that is good and compelling and interesting, that will, you know, inadvertently help indirectly help you rank for it. Mm 
But having a video on your page does not mean that you are going to rank. But if that video is good and it helps people, you know, get the information that they're after, then that in turn will help your page rank higher. Because it improves um, the page experience and that's what's important. And it's true. Yeah. And um, I agree with that. It's interesting to see how TikTok develops though. I want to, yeah. over the next 12 to 18 months, just see the direction that they take with the company. Because that's kind of what I, yeah. I love to do these things. Because I want to see opportunities where they lie. You mm -hmm. have been exceptional today, really. You've been very helpful. Help us to decode a very touchy topic because it's not very popular, but it's so effective. Those who are doing serious business online love SEO and everybody else are otherwise. That's the truth of the matter. One thing you didn't touch on, I'd like to just ask you before we wrap up because we started a little bit late and so on. What are your prices like? Or is it a case-by-case -case basis where it depends on the project and a timeline and so on that you can give a price? Yeah, um, yeah, price... It depends on the size of the website, um, the timelines, you know, the complexity of, of the ask of what's needed, you know, um, a language or a website in multiple languages is going to be, you know, pricier Ooh. than a mom and pop website that has like five pages. So it's going to vary. Um, and yeah, it, it always depends, but we're always happy to have a conversation to see if it's a good fit um, for both of us. You know, I don't look at SEO and these relations, like working with clients as a short-term temporary thing. We're always looking, you know, six months, a year, two years down the road. And ultimately we want to work with brands that also have that vision for their own business, right? And so that, that I think is a bigger, important piece for us than it is anything else. Um, you know, aligning on, uh, values and expectations and, and, you know, helping a business, you know, reach their goals and, and grow their organization. Um, for us that, that, you know, that's essential and ultimately like, you know, that's our calling card. Sounds good. Sounds good. Is there any question at all that you'd have want me to ask? or any topic you would have wanted me to touch on that I didn't do? No, I think this was, uh, this was good. I think it covered a lot of different facets, not just SEO strategy, but also kind of everything else that fits into digital marketing and SEO. And because none of this, none of this stuff operates in a silo, right? Like yes. your website exists around everything else. Your social media exists around everything else. And so you can't do one without the other. Sure. You can have an audience on TikTok, but what's the end game of that? How are you going to get them to, to pay you? And so and make purchases as anyway, well. that's true. You need to have a way to collect money from your audience. That's what I was taught recently. You've yeah. been wonderful. Thank you for your time today, Jesse. Yeah. I want to ask you, did you have a good time on the boardroom podcast today? I had a great time. Thank you so much for the conversation. It was lovely. That's great. We have a tradition on the podcast where whenever our guest is on, they've had a good time that we like to ask them, who is one guest that you would like to see on the podcast in the future? And for this guest, what is one question that you would like us to ask this guest for you? Man, that's a good, oh man, that's a good question. Um, hmm. <laughs> Can they, they have to be alive, right? It has to be like a real person then. Yeah, let's hope um, that way we can actually have the bond. Yeah. Um, hmm, just a sec. Uh, yeah. Um, da, da, da. Let me just, just make sure I get the name right. Yeah. Uh, I would love for you to have Sam Altman on. And the question I would love for you to ask him is... How do you foresee making sure that AI lives up to its utopian promise? How does AI continue to be the thing that helps us be better as a society? That's a, that's a good question. And, you know, we also have a lot of people who say that ultimately AI will be bad because of its potential to surpass human intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that would definitely be... A wonderful conversation to have with Sam. I'd like to have him on in the future. 
So thank you for your time today, Jess. You've been wonderful, educational, entertaining. I love your expertise. I love how calm and chill you are. Would definitely love to have you on again in the future in a panel discussion, just talking marketing love it. with other like-minded professionals. Sounds good? That sounds great. Let's do it. So um, okay. thank you. Thank you guys for tuning in as well. Remember, if you want to work with Jesse, the links are in the description below and in the show notes. And if you can't find him or you need help, just reach out to the Zellhan team. We'll connect you with him. And then you guys can go from there. Thank you and take care. <laughs>